about addiction. The tobacco industry will do anything that it can to keep current smokers smoking. It's about lives in jeopardy. Of all the people alive in this world today, we expect half a billion to be killed by cigarettes. They're called reduced hazard products. But would you smoke one? Search for a safe cigarette. A season premiere on Nova. Welcome to the broadcast. We begin this Friday evening with a review of the investigation into the tragic attack against America so far. We'll talk to Brian Ross, Chief Investigative Correspondent for ABC News. More FBI agents are working on preventing future attacks than are actually investigating what happened on September 11th. And part of it is, of course, they were caught so blindsided by this with so many people. Uh, so many people now arrested, in custody, detained. You know, the complete and total infiltration of this country by a terror group. At a time when they were saying, we've caught most of the cells, we're picking bin Laden apart bit by bit, men must be afraid. None of that was true. We continue with the leading terrorist investigator, researcher, and author, Jessica Stern of the Kennedy School at Harvard. All of us in the, the terrorism studies community are astonished by the, who those suicide bombers were. The idea that these sleepers who were well educated could live in the United States and not be influenced to hate us less. This is really troubling. They believe that they are doing good. We see them as evil. They see themselves as the ultimate martyrs. They believe they're on a humanitarian mission. And for a wider perspective on the foreign policy implications of all of this, Jessica Matthews of the Carnegie Endowment. They see us, I think, more and more uh, with a kind of take it or leave it approach to international governance. That is, um, that we pick and choose among the elements of international law and international problem solving uh, those bits that we want to apply to ourselves. Um, and they see us as what we are, the 800-pound gorilla. We conclude with filmmaker Rick Burns, who has a new film on PBS about New York. You know, it tells a story that's so pressing and so relevant, even before September 11th. Um, it tells the story of, of American cities, and it tells the story of the near death of American cities in a 50-year period after the Second World War, which what makes it so ironic to see it now. Last film is a parable of the death and resurrection of American urban places. The investigation, the foreign policy, and the city when we continue. Funding for Charlie Rose is made possible by Amazon.com, your online source for everything from books, music, and toys to videos, electronics, and tools. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders and by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide. From our studios in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. Joining me now in our continuing coverage of the investigation into the September 11th terrorist attack is Brian Ross. He is the Chief Investigative Correspondent for ABC News, and I am very pleased to have him here on this broadcast. Welcome. Thank you. Tell me where this investigation is, because you had a, a lead story this evening about the uh, investigation into this Algerian pilot who right. had some connection uh, not only to Al-Qaeda, but also to perhaps one or more of the uh, terrorists who died in the uh, plane attacks. Where is the investigation overall, and where do they think it's headed? They think they're getting close to the high command of the hijackers, past the 19 dead ones, but now into the people who provided the money, who provided the thinking and the planning, and the people who provided uh, the training. This pilot who was charged today in London, he's 27 years old, he's Algerian, he flew commercial jets, and he had meeting after meeting with many of the now dead hijackers. They have him, they say, on videotape, and he seems to be the one, according to what the British prosecutor said in court, he was in charge of making sure the pilots that came here were capable of taking a plane and aiming at one of those buildings and hitting it. 
And the pilots we've talked to say, that's not that easy. That's a difficult thing to do. You could miss the Trade Center Towers. Yeah. You could overfly the Pentagon. You're going at 300 to 500 miles an hour. Yeah. They had to have some knowledge of how to do that. Where is he? Where do they think he is? That pilot is in custody in London tonight. Is the he US, talking? He's not talking. The U.S. is asking for him. Uh, they want him badly because they feel they, they finally have somebody now who knew about the plans in detail. And they have charged him, it's interesting, they've charged him with lying to the FAA about knee surgery. He got a license here. He came to school in Arizona. And the charge is lying to the federal government. And what's the underlying context of that? He lied about knee surgery. He didn't tell the doctor who gave him his FAA medical certificate that he had yeah. knee surgery. And there's this long affidavit about how important that is. Now, there's not a chance in the world that normally anybody would be extradited in that count. But the reason is, if they charged him with murder or in the conspiracy, they'd have to assure... England, most likely, that he wouldn't be put to death. By doing it this way, they reserved the option of putting mm -hmm. him on the list of those who could be mm -hmm. executed. I think I saw in your piece where his attorney came out, his British attorney, and said he knows nothing he about knows this. He knows nothing about this, and it's a terrible act, and he, yeah. he's sure he'll be proven innocent. Right. Where are they in terms of presenting, I want to come back to this specific right. case, in presenting irrefutable evidence, as they would characterize it, to these members of the coalition that want to see the connective proof. Well, as you know, there's a big debate about that because yeah. the night of the attack, Senator Orrin Hatch went on television and said, we've heard, our intelligence people have heard conversations yeah, with people. Right, right. The CIA went nuts over that. It was very bad from their point of view because it gave away what they were doing and tipped off those people to stop talking yeah. to whatever phones they were talking to. Yeah, right. They are now tracking the money, and we reported tonight on ABC that they have found $100,000 that moved into the accounts in Florida of Mohammed Atta, transferred from banks in Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. They're getting close, they think. They're getting close. Follow the money. They tell us more arrests are expected this weekend in Germany of people who were the so-called masterminds. Mm -hmm. And when they get there, they think they'll get to what is, we've come to know now as Al-Qaeda. It's not going to get to Bin Laden. It's going to get probably yeah. to Egyptian and Algerian lieutenants, the people who work under Bin Laden in the Al-Qaeda organization, which is this umbrella group. Will they find that these, either the pilots who, and, and the members of the terrorist group who went down in the planes, had trained in Afghanistan at bin Laden or al-Qaeda camps. We think some of them have. Uh, John Miller reported on ABC the other night, uh, a man who had been inside the camp, and he identified one of the dead hijackers as in his class. But you're saying you don't think they'll get to they'll get to the organization that bin laden controls right runs finances with the help from other right. arab nationals right. but will not necessarily have irrefutable direct connection with him to him saying go ahead and do it right probably not what we're told is his lieutenants have broad leeway about what to do mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to get one of them to testify imagine a case against the ceo of a big company here they've called him the chairman of the board of terrorism right imagine going after the ceo of a large company where uh, a subsidiary has violated antitrust laws or you've got to build up the ladder and maybe there will be somebody at a mid-level who arguably in a criminal case could take the blame but it's in a broader context obviously now they, they, they he runs the organization he's responsible that may be good enough Okay. Is it your is your primary investigation, your primary <coughs> investigative work on this case having to do with the things we've been talking about, or are you also looking at in terms of the effort to get bin Laden in terms of grab his person in Afghanistan? No, what, what I've been working on for ABC is the investigation into how this happened, what was planned, and then yeah. what else is there that threatens us today? And to that end, we've reported this week on how they have thwarted at least two or three attacks in Europe against the U.S. Embassy in Paris. Right, I saw that. The U.S. Consulate in Marseille, yeah. uh, buildings at NATO headquarters in Brussels, and the European Parliament building in Strasbourg. All from Al-Qaeda. All from Al-Qaeda. Yeah. A separate cell. Yeah. Completely separate now, cell. What's the difference in one cell to the other? They wouldn't know each other's plans. Yeah. Somebody at a higher level would tell them their rough target date. Yeah. They wouldn't, if caught, be able to compromise the other cell. So they operate separately. They have a whole financial structure separately. Hmm. And it's, um, it's like any s good spy organization. They don't tell each other. And then as well, there's a separate group here, thought to be in the United States. Embedded, as they embedded, say. Embedded. Uh, um, somewhere out there are these men who they have found emails connecting them to the dead hijackers, who they know to have been flight trained. 
And there is this one man, the most intriguing thing to me is the fellow they arrested in August in Minneapolis. He is part of this uh, GIA group, the Algerian uh, terror group. He's arrested when he showed up asking to train on a flight simulator. He didn't care about takeoffs or landings, he just wanted to know how to fly. And he was arrested and he's in custody? Yes. He was arrested August 19th. Yeah. And the FBI got a tip from the flight school saying, this is strange. He had 20000 in cash. He wanted these lessons urgently. The FBI went out there. They realized his visa had expired, so they arrest him. They begin an investigation. They tell the flight schools they're investigating, he's done something very, very bad. The Minneapolis office investigates this. The Oklahoma office investigates this. But for some reason, this never got to the top people in Washington. Now, if it had, and if they had said, who is this guy, and they'd asked the French, the French would have said, oh, he's a known terrorist. He's, he's part of Al-Qaeda. He's an yeah. Algerian guy. Yeah. But that never happened. So Do he was sitting in the jail on the day of the crash, September 11th. Now, John Miller interviewed a guy in shadow <coughs> yes. who said he'd been a member of Al-Qaeda and he got out because he heard about some of the plans and he didn't go, want to go that far, right. correct? That's right. Now, is anybody talking? Is anybody like this guy sitting in the jail in Minneapolis, the Algerian, any of these guys talking? Well, there, there is one guy talking that we know of right. and he's in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and he was an Al-Qaeda guy, part of the Algerian group right. and they stopped him in July with an expired French passport. And he has talked, and he has provided the information about this group that was going to do the U.S. Embassy in Paris and so on. Yeah. He's talking. In this country, we don't know. At least I don't know. There is also this story that's been out around, which is that there's some big, I think Newsweek or Time, one of the Newsweek magazines had a story about some big guy in Europe who was running things in right. Europe, maybe out of Hamburg or maybe out of Germany. That's right. Now, what's, tell me more about that. They're closing in on him. We're yeah. told there could be arrests. Uh, they know where he weekend. is, probably. Well, they know where he's been. Yeah. And they are, th that is an active manhunt, and one day when we find out will be a, a great... Now, great what do they think he did or he knows? That he put it together, that he got Mohammed Atta. Yeah. He made sure he had the money. He made sure that Atta had access to 18 others. And this, the, the person arrested in London today, he came to the States um, in early 98. So if we back time it, we're mm -hmm. talking about three years ago, and you, can you think back to what you were doing in 1998? Yeah. I mean, when Mohammed Ali showed up, it was the month that uh, Ilian Gonzalez was returned to Cuba, wow. and President uh, Clinton then met with President Putin, and all those things were going on. And these guys, at that day at least, were planning this attack. Mm -hmm. So the next thing is you expect more roll-up of these guys at the at the higher level right you know that's what we're told and that and that's that's the goal now because uh while it's interesting in many ways to know what the 19 dead hijackers did and what they, they did were and so what they on said. and what's in the letter and it's fascinating yeah. uh, it doesn't help you prevent future attacks for the most part hmm. and it doesn't really you're not going to prosecute them does the federal government where you have lots of sources in justice especially i think believe don't know believe that uh expect other incidents, other attacks? Yes. 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 The answer is yes. Of this dimension? Hard to know. Uh, they expect it to perhaps not be so much ongoing, but yeah. episodic. How much is it, how much weight do you put on these reports of the truckers and the explosives and all of that? I, I put weight on that. I put great weight on that. I, I, it's rare, you've never seen it, but the mo more FBI agents are working on preventing future attacks than are actually investigating what happened on September 11th. I mean, the bulk of the agents now are almost in a paramilitary status where they're out mm -hmm. looking, they think, to prevent future attacks. And, and part of it is, of course, they were caught so blindsided by this with so many people, mm -hmm. uh, so many people now arrested, in custody, detained. You know, the complete and total infiltration of this country by a terror group. At a time when they were saying, we've caught most of the cells, we're picking bin Laden apart bit by bit, men must be afraid. None of that was true. How much criticism does the Clinton administration deserve for what they did or did not do, uh, with both in terms of trying to get bin Laden or understanding the extent? I'm not trying to say making them the villains of what has happened, but just to understand what should have been known. And I mean by the administration, not the president so much, but in a sense, the FBI, under the president, the CIA, under the president, the investigative agencies, under the president. 
there's no way to call this anything but a huge intelligence and law enforcement failure. I don't know how else you describe it. As to why, they weren't coordinated, they, a lot of bureaucratic yeah. reasons took over. You know, the usual thing where people are fighting over turf, I'm not going to tell this guy because I don't want to hurt my case. Yeah. Does everybody understand that? I mean, there's a consensus that people accept that as, as conventional wisdom now. I mean, yes. obviously, by definition, yes. almost. Oh, and you, you could cite case after case where the things weren't passed around or shared because right. it didn't quite have the urgency. Now, to be fair, you know, who could wrap their minds around a plot where you'd hijack sure. four planes and right. it would be so very, very evil. You know, the first thing we heard was that this could not be anything but state-supported. This was the first thing I sure. at this table. People said this had to be a very sophisticated operation. It turns out it was reasonably sophisticated in terms of embedding these people in the efforts they went. But people said there's no way anybody could have learned to have flown that kind of plane. But of course they did. Nineteen guys did it. Yeah. Uh, and the cost, the New York Times estimated about 200000 we added it up as best we could tell with all the travels, perhaps $400,000. Now, that's a lot of money, but it doesn't take uh, a state, it doesn't take Iraq or Iran. I mean, that, that's available to many terror groups, that kind of money. Um, Let me just take one yeah. reference. Bob Woodward had this morning uh, a piece called In Hijackers' Bags, oh, yeah. A Call to Planning, Prayer, and Death. Big story. Yeah. Big story. Big story. Justice had to have leaked this story to Woodward, or he got it somehow, meaning what? That they're because the, the, the Attorney General came out and talked about this story. Right this afternoon, today. they had released copies of it to yeah, every reporter right, in the country. Right, right, right. What is, is anything being made of that in terms of other than good investigative work by Bob? Well, I've not, uh, Bob Woodward is a great reporter, yeah. so he, he got it first, and he broke it, and he may have forced their hand because it was such a big story. I saw the New York Times reprinted in its entirety what you know the text of, of the letter. Um, and well, Give up the audience who doesn't sure. necessarily read the Washington Post every day. What did the letter say? Letter essentially was a four-page, five-page, handwritten letter that was found in the luggage of Muhammad Atta. He flew from Portland to Boston, and his luggage didn't make the connection. So they retrieved the luggage. Yeah. They found a copy of it in a, a car. They found another copy of it, actually, uh, in the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania, in the wreckage, strewn among the wreckage. So they have three different copies. And it was mimeographed or Xeroxed, whatever you want to call it. And essentially, it's, 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 a, it's a range of things I'm sort of invoking the faith this is something you fear death, we know that, but you must be prepared for yeah, that. There's yeah. a greater life that awaits you. And then some very practical advice. Uh, have clean shoes, have your knives and your IDs and your passports ready. And you will. And you will. And um, make sure no one's following you. The haunting writings, is according to Woodward, the yeah. haunting writings urge the hijackers to crave death and be optimistic. Right. At the same time, the document starkly addresses fear on the eve of their suicide mission. You have to face them and understand it 100%. Okay, obey God, his messenger, and don't fight among yourselves where you become weak and stand fast. God will stand with those who stand fast. Brian Ross, one of the best investigative reporters around, reporting for ABC News, uh, both in terms of Good Morning America and um, the World News with Peter Jennings. My thanks to Brian and to ABC. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Joining me now is Jessica Stern. She is a former member of the National Security Council. She is currently a lecturer on terrorism at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She is also the author of The Ultimate Terrorist, a book about the threat of chemical, nuclear, and biological warfare. I am pleased to have her here on this program. Welcome. Thank you. You think, quote, that most of the information available about Al-Qaeda comes from the trials of the four operatives convicted of the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. What would that tell us, and what does it tell us? There was a lot of information available at the trial that people pretty much ignored. For example, we learned that Al-Qaeda had a number of wings, a so-called documents wing, a finance wing, a public relations wing, an intelligence and surveillance wing. And most importantly, they were very concerned about counterintelligence. In fact, they seemed to be obsessed with dis how you could disappear in enemy territory. There was a manual revealed at the trial that instructed operatives that they should not look like Muslims, that they should shave their beards, wear Western dress, they should live in apartments in new developments where people don't Didn't know, know one other. another. Right. right, right. And nobody paid attention to this. Yeah. What else? What else? We learned that, something that actually I am learning through my own interviews, that operatives get involved in this for many different reasons. One, Kerchou said that he got involved par 
largely for adventure. He went to Afghanistan, he admitted, largely for adventure. Another, Al Fadl, went on at great length about how frustrated he was that he, as a, he was from Sudan, was paid less than his Egyptian counterparts. They were making $1,500 and he was making $500 and he was furious and he went to bin Laden and complained and bin Laden said, look, they've got passports, they have alternative employers. In other words, he was just, bin Laden was just like a CEO, paying them for the opportunity cost of their time. What do you know about bin Laden as a result of your research and your interviews? And Well, I, I have not interviewed bin Laden, so what I'm going to tell you is based on interviews of affiliated, leaders of affiliated I understood that groups. and I ask it in that way. Yeah, yeah. I think he, my sense is that he is very intelligent and one of the things that is very smart about what he does is that he's very good at mobilizing people, appealing to whatever it is that they want. So he finds a cleric who's able to explain to young men that killing innocents is acceptable, that if the person is a good person, he will go to paradise. And so in, in